Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. I, as always, am your host, Simon, and this one today, Margareta Peter versus the Devil. Uh, what happens here is... Uh, Margareta Peter? I know normally I make fun of pronunciations and just guessing people's names, but given that this is the main subject of today's video, I'm just gonna check the pronunciation on the main subject's name. Margareta nailed it. Okay, what happens here if you're new is Callum, our fine script writer, has written me a script. I have it in front of me right now. You just heard me tap it lightly. Then I'm gonna read it. I'm gonna add a little bit of commentary if I feel like it, when I feel is appropriate. I've never read this before, obviously, if, if, if you're new, you don't know that. And then Jen afterwards is gonna add some atmospheric music and images and all of that good stuff that uh, hopefully video and audio people appreciate. Video and audio, because if you didn't know, if you're listening to this podcast on whatever podcatcher, I think that's the right term, you use, you can also watch it on YouTube. And uh, I mean, you can see the images, you can see my face. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can also get it on audio. If you don't have YouTube Premium, that's actually quite cool because then you can like listen to it while you're driving along or whatever. Look, this is a long enough intro. And now there's going to be an intro from Callum. So <laughs> let's just jump in. It's all in God's plan. That's a phrase I've heard rolled out a thousand times to help us make sense of all the horrors of the world. I have to say, I know I'm already jumping in with my own thoughts and we're literally a line and three words in, and this, this despite being called a short, feels quite lengthy. I, I'm not, like, religious. I don't believe that there is... I, I mean, I don't not believe there's a god. I guess I'm, like, semi-agnostic. Um, but the idea, like, just letting go and being like, yeah, I guess it's all part of the plan, is really mentally good. You're like, yeah, there's a plan. There's a plan. It's all part of the plan. It's all part of the plan. <laughs> it's like, oh God, denial. The thing that gets me with that though is that one glance at the Old Testament is enough to convince me that I want nothing to do with the Alpha and Omega's plans. Guys messed up more lives than every serial killer we've covered combined. I did go to a religious school. I have read not the entirety of the Old Testament because the Bible is real long, but definitely parts of it. It's definitely weird. And thankfully for the world of true crime, some of his most ardent followers have done their very best to follow his divine example. In this episode, we're traveling to Switzerland, the country which has blessed us with one of the most outlandish religious murder cases in history. This is the story of Margareta Peter, a 19th century, ooh, going back in time. I mean, further back in time than all. A 19th century female preacher who makes today's crooked televangelists look positively saintly by comparison. Oh god, and those guys are like up to something. Have you guys seen that video of the super church guy or whatever it's called? Ah, oh, getting a phone call. We just began. Ah! Oh. Uh, okay, where were we? That was actually a delivery. Fun aside, we're getting uh, for this very channel. It's uh, it's a new camera, so upgraded visuals coming soon. Get excited, and let's get back to uh, oh, what are we talking about? Yeah, oh my God, the Christian like turbo preachers or whatever they're called. And there's that dude in that video, and he's like saying how he has to have a private jet, you know. And of course, because for whatever crazy reason, like churches are like tax exempt in the United States. <laughs> it's like what is going on? And he's like buying a private jet with his like parishioners money which he's not taxed on because he doesn't want to fly in a plane with demons <laughs> like my dude <laughs> you are crazy allegedly please don't sue me i'm sure you have lots of money um you do <laughs> you definitely do where's the money lebowski <laughs> The cult which she gathered around herself proved themselves so fanatically dedicated they were willing to die and kill for their beloved messiah Christ Reborn. Margareta Peter was born like her main man, JC, Jesus Christ, that is, on Christmas Day. It was in, the, was Jesus really born on Christmas Day? I thought that was just the thing that we made up. 
Anyway, it was the year 1794 in the village of Wildensburg, Switzerland, near Zurich. Margareta was the youngest of six children, with four older sisters and a brother. Her mother tragically passed away shortly after she was born. Despite being the baby of the bunch, little Margareta always appeared wise beyond her years. From the age of six, she would demand that her family gather around in the dining room to hear her deliver religious sermons. Margareta sounds a little bit insufferable, doesn't she? Her father soon noticed that the youngest had a talent for all that fire and brimstone malarkey. He was raising his kids according to his own Zwinglian Protestant faith, all right then, and came to believe that Margareta was a blessing from the Lord sent to lead the family, no, nay, the world, to salvation. <laughs> no pressure. This fostered quite a pushy personality in the young messiah. Yeah, it sounds like a really solid way to, you know, screw up a child. Which helped her to rope in her very first followers before she had even hit her teens. Aside from her doting family, neighbors would also come around regularly to hear her signature spin on the word of God. As is often the case, she was focused more on the threats of damnation than on the peace and love side of things. In 1816, Margareta, now in her early 20s, moved in with her uncle in the town of Rudolfingen to work as a housekeeper. It was in that town that she first came into contact with. <laughs> Turn the page. A new kind of Christianity ooh, called Pietism. These eccentric biblical fundamentalists invited the young woman into their study meetups where she gained a new perspective on the word of sin. In short, it was a tad mental. <laughs> All right. The pietists believed in speaking in tongues and receiving visions from God. Ah, so they believed in nonsense. Far and people admit Simon speaking in tongues is real. There's, there's going to be, if you're on YouTube right now, look down at the comments. I haven't deleted any. I mean, unless they got real crazy. Uh, there's, there's probably people who are like, tongues is real. Tongues, I've spoken in tongues. And I'm like, you might have you were delusional. Far from the standard psalm and sing song Christianity that I grew up with. Yes, this does sound rather far removed from, you know, uh, I guess maybe Callum also grew up in a Christian. I mean, I, my family aren't, but I went to the Christian school and it's like, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's not bad. I kind of, it's kind of all right. Like, I mean, chapel was really boring, but it was all right. These radical Bible bashers had already stirred up some trouble with the authorities in Switzerland and abroad due to their aggressive evangelism, but even they would soon be looking to distance themselves from this fresh-faced prophetess in their midst. What is she going to do? Isn't she like a teenager? <laughs> when Maggie returned home after a year, she seemed different, as if the joy of her faith was gone. She spent more and more time sitting alone, ruminating on the wickedness of the world. She told her family that God was revealing himself to her more and more every day, so that she became daily more conscious of her own sinfulness. After being kicked out of another prayer group for reporting heavenly visions that didn't sit right with the leader's beliefs, she decided to start her own fundamentalist circle. She started leading sessions at the family home, and as news of her prodigious preaching spread, more and more followers flooded through the doors. I do find it curious why people get drawn to this, like the fire and brimstone stuff. It's like, do we really, like, I always thought it would be quite kind of like a niche interest to be told that you're a sinner and terrible, but it says it doesn't seem to be that much of a niche interest. I'm like, I'd much rather go to the church where they were like, everyone is glorious. Every Jesus loves you. That sounds way better. And I know it exists. <laughs> That's what I would sign up. I wouldn't, but that's what I would sign up for if someone was like, which one you have to choose. Maggie's ego grew with her flock, and in her early 20s, she declared herself a full-blown prophet of the Almighty. Her visions became ever more vivid, showing that the world was nearing Judgment Day and that only she could deliver her followers from evil. Her spoiler alert, that Judgment Day hasn't come. It's over a hundred years later. Her sub well over a hundred years later. Her sermons grew ever more frenzied, ever more unhinged. She's not the Messiah, she's a very naughty girl. Her most dedicated followers were a trio of servants who her father had hired in her absence, Ursula, Henrik, and Margaret Jagley. Along with her sisters, they would make up a core group of apostles. Jagley hoped that Margareta would be able to cure her epilepsy, but she ended up more of a prop than a patient. Someone prone to fits of convulsions could add a bit of flavor to a sermon on possessions and prophecies. Ah, yes, the past. <laughs> it's like... Uh, what's wrong with this person who has epilepsy? They're having a seizure. It's ghosts in their body! Perhaps the most dedicated follower of all was Ursula. She's quoted at, she's quoted claiming that Christ revealed himself in the flesh through her, and that through her many thousands of souls were saved. All right, thousands already? How many followers do you have? 
chill out. To make that dream a reality, she even joined Margareta in traveling around the country along with her sister Elizabeth. From 1820 onwards, the trio would take regular trips to towns far and wide, spreading Maggie's doctrine to the people of Switzerland. Everywhere she went, she would gain new groups of rabid devotees. I hope they weren't really rabid, because rabies is crazy. If you don't know about rabies, look up. I'm not going to go into explaining rabies right now because this was literally a word used to just as, as just a describing words. I can't remember what describing words are called. Is it an adjective? <laughs> oh God, I'm so stupid. <laughs> rabies is crazy. Wikipedia that. Shit. But much like the first century Romans, the Swiss authorities were none too happy with having what they believed to be a religious nutjob roaming the countryside. They kept close tabs on the Peter household, and in 1821, oh, it's like 200 years ago, uh, they banned the meetings altogether. That wasn't enough to stop Margareta, though. She kept up her holy mission, and later that year, she traveled to the town of Il, Il Now. Maybe. I'm sorry, Swiss people, I, I, if it's in Switzerland. There, she and her sister were welcomed into the home of a shoemaker named Jacob Morf or Jacob Morf. I'm not sure how the Germans pronounce Jacob. Despite the fact that Jacob was married, I'm just going to go with the English pronunciation because it's easier and I'm lazy. Uh, here, Margareta became extremely close. Uh-oh. Letters were later uncovered in which the prophetess promised that she and Jacob would one day sit on a heavenly throne together after their ascension. Meanwhile, his actual wife was left on the sidelines saying, Hello, <laughs> not dead yet. Oh, awkward. Reports on what happened next differ. Some say that it's impossible to know whether Maggie and Jacob did the dirty deed, while others claim that she actually gave birth to his kid after staying there for a year and a half, despite celibacy being a core part of her teachings. What's that? The leaders of an organization doing things that they demand their followers don't do? Weird. I've no I mean, that is so unusual and and unheard of, and and this is also sarcasm. <laughs> uh, hypocritical preacher, surely not. I've never heard of such a thing. Callum and I are on the same page yet again. Whatever went down between the two, Margareta left in a hurry in 1822. She pretty much dropped off the radar of the police at this point, but not because she had thrown in the towel. She and Elizabeth locked themselves up in the upper chambers of the family home. The two did little other than sleep, pray, fast, repeat for months on end. Sounds super boring. Perhaps her failure to... I mean, I love sleeping, but praying fast and fasting is like lame... <laughs> I like eating and not praying. If we replaced it, replaced fasting with eating and praying with, I don't know, watching high quality TV, like the TV series For All Mankind, which I just finished, which is incredible. Simon, get back to the facts. Perhaps her failure to practice what she preached drove her into deeper fits of mania. When she eventually began emerging from the room in early 1823, oh my god, it's like a year later, Margareta's preaching was more apocalyptic than ever. She claimed that she had received visions detailing the end of the world, and surprise, surprise, it was coming soon. And again, spoiler alert, no, it wasn't. Seems like that's what all cult leaders claim when they're running low on ideas. Maggie's Inferno Things must have seemed pretty bleak for the faithful in Wildensburg. Not only was the world about to end, but God had chosen Margareta to defend humanity against Satan himself. And by this point, she was a few psalms short of a hymn book. Uh, however, if any of her flock were concerned about the way things were headed, they did not dare say it out loud. Throughout January and February, she regularly descended to the living room and shared her prophecies with the small congregation. These included the revelation that Napoleon Bonaparte's son, the Duke of Reichstadt, was imminently, would imminently declare himself the Antichrist. How ridiculous. Everyone knows that's a barber. That's Callum's comment, not mine. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and assume sarcastically. At the same time, did people really say Obama was the Antichrist? <laughs> oh my god, chill out, guys. At the same time, I'm sure people said it about Trump. I'm sure people said it about George W. I'm sure people said it about Bill Clinton and whoever was before him. Bush Sr., maybe? <laughs> At the same time, the rest of the Peter family started reporting horrifying visions of the future. Margareta's hold over her suggestible siblings spread throughout her entire flock, and she soon had dozens of followers convinced that the end was nigh. I get the feeling the end is going to involve death of some variety, because so far, I mean, this is a casual criminalist episode and no one has died. So, uh, 
Let's get into it. On Wednesday, March the 12th, Margareta gathered all of them together in her home for what would be her biggest spectacle yet. While the sermon was in full flow, her disciple Margaret Jagley is said to have gotten a fright from a loud pop in the fireplace, triggering an epileptic fit. This was the tinder that lit a bonfire of religious mania. Maggie P then claimed to have a vision of Napoleon himself marching upon them with a demonic army, coming to claim the afflicted woman's soul. She cried out, Lo, I see Satan and his firstborn. I, I know, I know she's not a South American preacher, but I just want to. I just want to do it in this voice. Please just grant me this. I know it's terrible, but it, it, I, it's just joy. I just get such joy. Lo, and I see Satan and her firstborn floating in the air. They are dispersing their emissaries to all corners of the earth to summon their armies together. Oh my god, that felt good. With the demonic hordes fast approaching. With the demonic hordes fast approaching. Uh, that isn't a quote, so I'm just, I, I, I'm sorry. Let's not do that again. Margareta demanded that her followers bar the doors and windows of the house and let nobody in. Once they were barricaded from the forces of evil outside, she ordered her holy army to grab whatever weapons they could find. Fire pokers, chairs, hatchets. Hard to see how they hoped to defeat Napoleon and a horde of demons, but... Top marks for tenacity. Fully armed with random household objects, they retreated to Margareta's attic bedroom and locked the door. Once inside, she cried out that demons had made it inside and started wildly smashing apart the furniture. Her followers followed suit, swinging their weapons around the room in a frenzy and trashing everything in sight. That madness went on for a full three hours. Three hours of grown-up adults battling imaginary demons. <laughs> it does. It's a, little, it's, it's a little bit ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, although, if I was there, I'd be like, we get to smash up some furniture with an axe. <laughs> Sign me up! Now, I've never read the book of Revelation, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't describe the Battle of Armageddon as a couple of dozen Swiss nutjobs trashing a farmhouse. I could be wrong, though. Oh, after the invisible demonic hordes were cleared from the bedroom, the gang of crazed crusaders pushed on downstairs. After taking an hour or so to catch their breath in the living room, Margareta asked them if they were willing to bleed for God. Unsurprisingly, they were game. She ordered them to start beating themselves with their fists and weapons. This is getting more dark suddenly, isn't it? We went from like them trashing a room to being like, oh, people are going to get really hurt. Uh, the more they bled, the more powerful they, the more power they would gain against the forces of darkness. All right then. What began as a slightly off-the-wall prayer group had devolved into Sunday school for sadists. If anyone got tired and tried to take a rest, Margareta would have the others gang up on them into, uh, until they started smacking the sin out of themselves. Oh my. As you can imagine, all of this made a pretty big racket, so a crowd of villagers gathered outside the house shortly after it began. It said that the bizarre battle inside knocked a plank of wood from an outside wall and gave them a view of what was going down inside. The Messiah denounced these concerned neighbors as agents of Satan there to sabotage the ritual. <laughs> the ritual of crazed people just smashing up a farmhouse and beating the sin out of each other. Satan's minions watched on in confusion as Margareta handed out some divinely sanctioned beatdowns on her sister Elizabeth, then her father, and all the rest of the congregation, all whom consented to it in the name of God. I don't think you can consent to a beating. I mean, I, I, uh, you can, but then if those people are later like, I'd like to press charges against the beating you gave me, the defense can't be, you let me. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't think so. I'm not sure. Not a lawyer. Consent or no consent? All of that was very, very illegal. Oh, okay, there we go. Thank you, Callum, who's also not a lawyer, but I'm guessing he looked this shit up, unlike me. I just sit here and read. <laughs> this is a, such a great job. <laughs> oh, not least because the prophetess was supposed to be banned from holding these little gatherings in the first place. Some of the townspeople eventually fetched the police, who broke down the door and called a halt to the whole calamity, since they had already softened themselves up nicely. <laughs> oh, Callum, dude. <laughs> from the beating. Uh, it didn't take much wrestling to get the weapons away from these zealots. The cops then separated the men and women into two separate rooms. The male detainees were left to simmer down without the influence of their messiah, but Margareta kept the women simmering away. The majority of the guys were dismissed and sent home, and with that the police believed they had defused the situation and took off. Dudes. Why is it that every casual criminalist there has to be an example of police being a little bit lazy? Back at their office, they began proceedings to have Elizabeth and Margareta committed to an insane asylum. Oh, good. Okay. At least they went home to do that. I guess there's only two, two of them. But this messiah still had one last miracle to perform before morning. 
The Horror of Wildensburg. Had everyone just sensibly went home to bed after the police left, it's unlikely that we'd be talking about the story today, but that wasn't to be. After the crowds dispersed and her dominion over the household was restored, Margareta summoned the remaining followers, including her father and sisters, upstairs. Ah, oh, this is gonna get really... I mean, I knew where this was headed, and I still was, like, upbeatly hoping that it wasn't gonna end, like, with the regular cult people of killing themselves, but I know where we're going. Oh god, why? Can't we just enjoy ourselves for once? Can't, can't you be like, and that's where it ends. Everyone lived happily ever after. Margareta went to an insane asylum. Woo! Thank you for listening, but no. She insisted they continue their sadistic frenzy to ward off evil. When her brother arrived in the house to check on what the hell was happening, she attacked him with a metal wedge, and he had to be carried downstairs by their father. At that point, Margareta was struck with another vision. The ghost of her mother appeared and insisted that Margareta sacrifice herself so that the world could be saved. Her followers were a bit taken aback by the idea, but eventually they began to come around. However, Elizabeth wouldn't hear it. Truly believing St. Maggie to be the the savior of mankind, she asked to be killed in her place. She began beating herself again, but Margareta was about to up the ante. She smacked her sister in the head with a hammer, sending her tumbling to the ground in spasms. Margareta, what are you up to? Stop it. Uh, her followers were a bit taken aback by the- I mean, she's obviously, like, mentally unwell. She's- I, and this is, like, 1820s. So they're not gonna be like, oh, you're hearing, hearing voices. That's the voice of God. Better do what he says, rather than you're hearing voices. Let's get you to some professionals who will give you some pills, which will hopefully make those voices go away. But no, this was the 1820s. Even in the 1920s, were we still crazy back then? Like, in, in like, God's talking to you? Like, really? I think I said it actually last episode. Or maybe it was on a different channel. Whatever. If you're talking to God, A-okay. If God's talking to you, get checked out. <laughs> Solid advice that bears repeating. You're welcome. The servant Ursula leapt in, another of the followers after her. Together, they beat poor Elizabeth to death right then on the floor. When the mob backed off, her twisted broken body lay in a crumpled heap. That wasn't enough for the Almighty, though. Margareta knew that he demanded a bigger sacrifice, which meant she'd just bludgeoned her big sister to death for nothing. So she asked herself, what would Jesus do? The answer was pretty simple. More blood must flow. Yeah, it sounds like Jesus, doesn't it, Margareta? Jesus famous for saying, more blood must flow. <laughs> All right. I have pledged myself for the saving of many souls. I must die now. You must crucify me. Jesus wasn't voluntarily crucified. Pretty sure. Her followers exchanged a few awkward glances. Did she just say, uh, crucify? Does she, uh, really want to be crucified? It's very unpleasant. That was a bit too hardcore even for them. The Messiah sensed their trepidation and said, It is better that I should die than thousands of souls should perish then smacked herself in the skull with the hammer just to prove how serious she was. At that point, the servant Heinrich wisely knobbed out of there, while the rest of the mob gathered nails and planks of wood downstairs. Some were still skeptical about killing their leader. Perhaps the twisted corpse of Elizabeth had given them a bit of a reality check, but Margareta was a master of dragging people deep into mass mania. She promised that both she and Elizabeth would be resurrected in three days' time. So the disciples went about forming wood into a crude crucifix. They then drove thick nails through Margareta's hand, and feet, pinning her to the cross. After that, they hammered some elbows. Where are the police? This has got to be making a noise. Aren't they going back? Maybe you should go back to check the next day on the people you just left there. They left all the women there, right? They sent the men home, and we're like, you'll be fine, women. Just hang out there. Don't crucify everyone. All right? Didn't work out. You should have gone back and checked, police. Come on. After that, they hammered some through her elbows and breasts. Why? All the while, the willing victim encouraged her killers on. It seems like her delusions gave Margareta a superhuman tolerance for pain. The brain is super powerful, though. Like, I can totally believe this. The group then lifted the cross from the floor and mounted it on the wall, leaving Margareta to hang there while they joined hands in prayer. If you've read your Bible, you'll know that crucifixion is by no means a quick way to die. We don't know exactly how long Margareta hung there for, only that the pain eventually grew too much to bear. She asked that they stab her through her heart to put an end to her suffering. However, the disciples weren't too handy with a knife, so they botched the job. Oh god, no. Uh, their next best idea was to grab the hammer and a crowbar and bludgeon Margareta around the head until she was dead. Jesus, guys, come on. Uh, the, next, the less time you spend imagining the visuals of those last few passages, the better. Yes, let's not do that. 
But her followers weren't phased. Still believing the Margareta Peter would rise from the dead in three days, the congregation, including her own father, gathered around the bodies to pray. After that, they went downstairs and enjoyed a dinner like nothing happened. One of the police officers returned in the middle of the meal to serve documents summoning the group to court. I feel like that would be a bit of a reality check right there. <laughs> it's like, what's going on? I'll go to court. Oh, oh, oh. What have we done? He left completely unaware that the brutally beaten corpses of two young women were hidden in the attic. Three days passed, with all the remaining followers eagerly anticipating the glorious resurrection of the dead girls. Aren't they just in the attic? They're just going to come down? But no one's like, what's that smell? <laughs> When the time of the prophecy came, they went back upstairs to welcome the Messiah back to Earth, but all they found were a pair of corpses well into the early stages of decomposition. Things were not looking particularly promising. If the two women were to come back to life, their skulls would be pretty messed up, not a pretty sight at all. Still, it was easier to believe that there were some delays on Heaven's side than accept that they had savagely killed two people for absolutely no reason. So the congregation kept faith. They tried removing the nails from the body in case that that's what, in case that's what was holding things up. Oh my god, the delusion is so strong. But another day passed, then another. Margareta still refused to revive herself, and the stench was getting pretty bad. After five days of letting the two women rot in the attic, it was time to face the music. They were not coming back. So Margareta's father walked into the middle of town and reported the deaths to the pastor. Wrap up. From that day forward, the manic tragedy of Margareta Peter entered the realm of local folklore, known as the Horror of Wildensbuch. The followers who remained at the house that night were brought before a magistrate on December 3, 1823, 11 of them in total. Ursula Kundig received the longest sentence, 16 years. Her unwavering loyalty meant that she followed her leader's commands the most viciously of all. The rest got sentences from six months to eight years, depending on their level of involvement. The father, Johannes Peter, was sentenced to eight years. Even after being convicted for the role in murdering of his two own children, he refused to renounce his beliefs. He maintained that Margareta was set apart by God for some extraordinary purpose. Well, I guess we'll never know, mate, because you let some maniacs crucify her in your home. Yeah, I mean, agreed. Also, Callum here writes that he refused to give up his beliefs. I'm like, dude, well, there's two things. There's two possible outcomes, like, or options. One, you give up your beliefs and you admit that you murdered your children. Or two, you remain in your delusion. I completely understand why he remained in his delusion. It just goes to show that there's no reasoning with the cultist. It's often a fine line between faith and fanaticism, and given the right circumstances, it's easy for some people to fall far over to the wrong side. So the next time you're stuck in a boring church sermon, just be thankful that your pastor isn't ordering you to beat your parents to cast Napoleon back to hill. Yeah, I mean, when it's all summed up like that, it does sound particularly bonkers, doesn't it? I'd like to finish this up with a reminder that I'm not hating on Christianity with anything I've said in today's episode. Yeah, I, I do worry. I like, I don't, not worry, but it's like, I really, I, I make jokes. It's kind of like what I add to this. I mean, other than just like, stupid jokes, to be fair. But I do, I don't mean it in like a disparaging way. It's, I intend it in my mind. It's, it's to be good humored. I hope it comes across as good humored. If it doesn't, then I, uh, I actually apologize. Because I, I don't intend to hate. It's just, uh, like especially, I mean, maybe on the like, Southern Preachers, where it's like, give me all your money and I'll save you from Jesus. It's like, yeah, okay, guys. That's a little bit too far, isn't it? Um, but uh, not in general. I'm well aware that the vast majority of believers aren't planning on smashing anyone's skulls. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'd say at least, at least the majority. <laughs> Again, that's a joke. The actual culprit here is more likely our old friend's undiagnosed mental illness coupled with a fascinating case of mass hysteria. Uh, yes, for sure. As I was saying with the whole analogy of it being 1821, not 2021. They don't give her a pill, they just think it's actually got. Because of young one, one young woman's struggle with very real demons that nobody understood at the time, she was ensnared by violent delusions that ultimately led to her untimely death at just 27. Although she promised salvation, in the end, Margareta Peter brought sheer hellish horror to the small Swiss village of Wildensburg. But not to worry, it's all in God's plan. Peace be with you. <laughs> Can of savage. Yeah, it's a, it was like savage, savage, savage. Oh, and now a joke. <laughs> Dismembered appendices. 
The main version of the Margareta Peter narrative and the source of our quotes was recorded in an 1891 book called Historic Oddities and Strange Events by Anglican priest Sabine Baring Gould, the guy who wrote Onward Christian Soldiers. What a banger. I vaguely remember that hymn. That's a pretty significant gap between the time it happened and the book's publication, so it's very possible that some details might have been morphed and added to over the years. Number two, if you're thinking about visiting the site of Margareta's demonic siege, dark tourist style, do forget about it. The house was burned down shortly after these events to pretend, prevent her disciples and other pietists from turning it into a pilgrimage site. The last thing the neighbors needed was more of that lot smashing up the joints. And this, as always, has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist. I've been your host, Simon. Writer, of course, was Callum. Uh, video editor and audio master was Jen. Thank you both. Thank you as well, dear listener or viewer, for watching or listening. It's complicated when this goes out in two formats. Gotta thank everybody. <laughs> and uh, yeah, leave a review if you're listening to this. Leave a like if you're watching on YouTube or a comment or something like that. And I will see you all in the next episode.